Okay, good evening, everybody. Just to clarify, what the little thing is up there, we're taping all the lectures just so we can put them on YouTube. Okay, we have about, uh, we have four different sets on YouTube right now. When I finish this series, it'll also go on YouTube. I'm trying to get them all out there so, you know, you can, at home, you can have a good time and enjoy them. What can I tell you? Keep it simple and it's fun. That's what that is. They're only recording me, not you, so don't get nervous. Okay, except for him. <laughs> we always record him. He's a movie star, that's why. <laughs> anyway, I want to just kind of share a couple of things with you to kind of get started. We have four uh, educational programs and things going on here that we can part you can participate in if you want to. I just want to kind of tell you about them. And we have a sign-up sheet here if anybody's interested in being part of it. Okay, uh, just to kind of show you, um, Jeff Farnsworth is one of our therapists. On the last Saturday of this month, is doing an all-day retreat, and basically it's a coded, uh, codependency uh, day of recollection. So you're, if you're interested in getting information about it, you can sign your name afterwards and your phone number and stuff. Also on Thursday nights, starting in on the 31st of January. We're going to be doing a support group here every Thursday at 7 o'clock using the Recovery Bible and the workshop that goes along with it. It's the Christian concept of the 12 steps based on the Recovery Bible. Okay, and th that will meet here at 7 o'clock on Thursday nights starting on the 31st of, of January. Also, at the beginning of February, um, Gary, Gary Rock, one of our new therapists, is going to be doing a 12-step program uh, for people in recovery. they will be able to t take a journey through the steps. Okay, that's also available there, too. And last but not least, tomorrow, from 1 to 3 in the afternoon, if you want to kind of come, uh, Marie Olwell, who's one of our therapists, and is doing a program on aging with grace. That's for all of us with white hair. It's fantastic. But that's for everybody, really. Anyway, it's, it's tomorrow afternoon from 1 to 3, you know, and he needs it desperately. That's why we're running a program just for him. No, it's not a problem. Oh, no, hey, i got to bust you again. You know that. Anyway, all that information is there. We have flyers in the front. You can pick them up. And all the other stuff for Starting Point is on the website. The lecture schedules, all the programs, everything's on the website. You can check it out if you want to, okay? And we're trying to get as much as possible out there, so it's all part of the process. Okay? No more commercials. That takes care of that. You want to take care of that? Okay, I'm going to begin by doing the reading tonight from The Language of Letting Go, which is another meditation book for codependency. January 16th. As a matter of fact, prayer is the only real action in the full sense of the word, because prayer is the only thing that changes one's character. A change in character or a change in soul is a real change. Emmett Fox. Erica Zhang has said that we are spiritual beings who happen to be human. Praying and meditating are ways to take care of our spirit. Prayer and meditation are disciplines suggested by the 11th step of our 12-step recovery programs. Prayer and meditation are not necessarily connected to organized religion. Prayer and meditation are ways to improve our personal relationship with a higher power to benefit ourselves, our lives, and our growth. Praying is how we connect with God. We don't pray because we have to. We pray because we want to. It's how we link our soul to our source. We're learning to take care of our emotions, our mind, and our physical needs. We're learning to change our behaviors. But we're also learning to take care of our spirit, our soul, because that is where all change begins. Each time we talk to God, we are transformed. Each time we connect with a higher power, we are heard, touched, and changed for the best. Today I will practice my prayer and meditation. Whether I feel desperate, uneasy, or even peaceful, I will take the effort to connect with my higher power, at least for a moment today. 
I kind of love that reading when I did it this morning because I really believe that the concept of the 11th step about prayer and meditation is the foundation of everything we do in the program. I always joked about the 11th step prayer, my favorite prayer. I say it every morning. But I've often said it's a very dangerous prayer because what you're saying in the prayer is you're saying your will, not mine. You're actually saying that the higher power is in charge. You aren't. And I'm a codependent, so I got a scheduling book. I got my whole entire day scheduled. And every day, it's amazing. I would say that prayer, and God screws it up every damn day. <laughs> Today, he screwed it up three times. It's totally amazing when you come down to it. You know, so I, le I learned to laugh. Because I've learned the most secret of life, we're going to talk a lot about that tonight, is something called adjustment. Last week when we started this series, we did an overview of codependency, the traits, the characteristics. And I talked about three basic areas. I talked about the concept that the addictive personality in all of us has a tendency either to move towards something called isolation, or the other part is fantasy, or caretaking. Now tonight I want to really concentrate on what I refer to as the addictions that are connected to the source of isolation or hiding or running. And these are, these are things that we migrate towards because basically many of us are scared of change, we're scared of new things in the course of our life, and we're used to the old. So transition and change is one of the most powerful spiritual things on the face of this earth. But the bottom line is very simple. Most of us migrate towards different types of addictions because deep down inside, we're spiritually empty and spiritually dead. When I use the word spiritual, as most of you who know me, I'm not talking about religion. The word comes from Latin and Greek. The word means spiritus actualis, which means an awakening to a discovery of my personal spirit. You get in touch with the spirit or the energy that makes me the unique individual that I am. See, try to remember something. Your body is only a casing. What makes you different from everybody else is your energy and your spirit. Your spirit is your foundation of life. You know, it's very powerful sometimes, and I've had the wonderful experience on my journey, both as a priest and even now in the concept of my new areas of my life, to be able to be at the bedside of many people when they've died. To be with someone at that moment of death is such a powerful spiritual experience. It's almost as if and I can't even explain it. I wish I could. You have to feel it. It's almost like at the moment that they, they leave, you can almost feel their spirit leaving their body. The body instantaneously becomes cold because it no longer has the energy or the spirit inside of it. That's why I really believe nobody dies. I think your body does. But your spirit, your uniqueness, and your specialness simply is passed on. It's a different concept in life. And that's why you have to learn something about recovery, which is so important. Many of us have a tendency, and this goes back to three basic things that many of us have experienced in growing up a lot of times, and the things that lead to isolation, to running, and to hiding. One is emptiness, having no idea who you are as a person. The other one is loneliness. Loneliness is one of the scariest things on the face of this earth. When you're lonely, it means you're empty. And thirdly, identity. So many of us have no sense of who we are. And I'll share this on a personal level. When I was in the priesthood, and even my years before the priesthood, I can honestly say today, I had no idea who I was. I functioned, I was external. But see, external does not mean internal. There was no internal me. Everything was external, everything was a show I put on on the outside. And I, I understand today that deep down inside I was spiritually empty and spiritually dead. That sa sounds strange because I was a priest. How could I be spiritually empty and be spiritually dead? Well, I realized something. In many years of my life, especially the first 44 years of my life, I never really had a sense of real personal spirit. I was more religious, yes. I knew the rituals. I knew the things to say and to do. But in here, I really did, was not existing. And so as a result then, I had to be able to function externally. And so what I learned about these particular addictions we talked about tonight, 
drugs and alcohol, another form of them, relationships, you know, things such as work. I can make anything into an addiction and come right down to it. But the bottom line is so many of us are searching for what I call a hiding place. The priesthood, for me, especially in the early years, was a great hiding place. They even gave me a collar. Now I know the collar, and I won't get into that. But that's all right. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I basically had an identity. But the identity wasn't me. It was the role that I played. So many people, and of course, your jobs and things to that effect, we basically look at life, and it's who I, I identify who I am by what I do. We have no real sense of who are you deep down inside. What is your spirit? Where does that come from? When you have a lot of fear, a lot of loneliness, a lot of isolation, a lot of emptiness, you have a tendency to be scared of two simple things. We're scared of change, and we're scared to be able to move on. See, change is one of the scariest things on the face of the earth, and yet I've got to share some tonight with you. Change is one of the most powerful elements of life. Everything in life is in constant change. Nothing stays the same. Isn't it wonderful? But so many of us are searching for absolutes. But there are no absolutes. There's simply the process of life. And as you go through life, things are always in constant process of changing. But then along with that, so many of us have a tendency to want to have a place to hide, to run. And when I'm empty on the inside and spiritually dead inside, I keep searching for an identity externally. But I gotta tell you a secret, please don't tell anybody. External things come to an end. No matter what you have externally means nothing. What you have internally means everything. You can have the greatest amount of money in the world, the greatest amount of everything in the world, but those things don't mean a thing. Because sooner or later, you gotta look within the mirror. You know, a good psychiatrist friend of mine, I love this guy, said to me a long time ago, he said, and it's real simple, it's not complicated. He said, there's one person you must wake up to every morning. That person is you. There's one person you can't divorce. So if you gotta spend all that time with that person, you might as well get to know them, to love them, to celebrate them, and to enjoy them. See how simple it is? So instead of running around, trying to figure out who they are, and trying to change them, but the real reality of life is I've learned that every one of us goes through those three detoxes I talk about all the time in life. That's what change really is all about. We go through physical detox or physical changes. We go through emotional detox or emotional changes. We go through spiritual detox or spiritual changes. And so in the, the process of life, there's always this process of change taking place. To me, that's exciting. I don't want to ever be done. Please don't ever be done. Remember, every day is a new adventure. Every day is something new. And one of the things we have to learn is that I have to learn how to take that risk. And change is a risk. I mean, I'll give an example. Even in my own life, I can only share from my own experience and my own strength. But when I was in the priesthood, I was very comfortable. My whole life, that's all I knew. My mother, you know, helped me to become a priest by putting me in the seminary when I was 14 years old. I had no idea what was going on. I was confused as hell. And I spent 12 years there, 20 years in the priesthood, had no idea at all what was going on around me. And as a result, then I became very comfortable in my role. It was a safe place to be. People in their jobs a lot of times they do the exact same thing every day till 10 years after they're dead. They think they're still alive, even though they aren't. They function. They go through rituals. We go through things in life. But what is life really all about? It's about detoxing physically. What do I mean by detoxing physically? It means I have to be able to realize the fact that addiction is a way for me to run away from the reality of myself as an individual. I can hide. And many of us have done this for a long period of time. I know I have. I have all kinds of secrets, and I lived in hiding for a long period of time. Because I was w always worried about if I really share with people what's going on inside of me, then they might not like me. They might think 
ill of me. I was always worried about what people on the outside were thinking. I never realized the fact that it's not important. What's important is, how do you feel about yourself on the inside? When it comes to your emotions, that emotional detox, you have to realize the fact that many of us are going through a grieving process every day of our life. We're letting go of the old and discovering the new. It's a process we go through. And I love the concept of the process of life. I use my mantra all the time. I've said it so many times. Trust the process, the process works. Cooperate with the process and live the process. And the adventure of life, the celebration of life, is allowing yourself to go through that process. But many of us have what I call a disease. I call it a disease. It's called, you know, an intellectual disease. My nickname for it is the I know disease. I love the I know disease. Now, example of my own life. I knew intellectually 10 years before I left the priesthood that I wanted to leave. I can give you 58 reasons why. But the bottom line was I was too scared, I was too afraid, and I was too comfortable. I was comfortable in the environment that I was in. At least I knew it. Now, yesterday when I was working at the rehab, I shared some of this stuff with some of the addicts. When the addict is in their active addiction, and they've done it for so many years, that is normal to them. They take away the embalming fluid, they get into recovery, and the old them is this big, the new them is only this big. Transition and change. Now, eventually, hopefully, this will get bigger and this will get smaller as time goes on, and they'll get balanced after a while. But it takes time. It's all part of the process. And so one of the hardest things we have to do is to be able to release the old, to say goodbye to it, to watch it come to an end so nothing, something new can be born. And that brings us into the two things that scare most of us when it comes to isolation and it comes to hiding. We're scared of change, and we're scared to lose control. Two scariest things on the face of the earth. And that's why fear is something that keeps us away from making decisions in our life. But above all, we're scared of risk. You see, one of the great adventures of life, and believe me when I tell you, for 44 years of my life, I never would have done any of this. You know, it's easy to talk about it today and share it. But the first 44 years of my life, I would not stand up here and say what I'm going to say right now. In those first 44 years, I was scared of everything. But I'm good at putting a show on. I was a showman. What can I tell you? I could basically do all kinds of stuff. Everybody thought I had my act all together. But basically, I used alcohol in the secrecy of my room. I did other things that are crazy. I was involved in all kinds of insanity. But basically, to me, insanity was normal. I actually liked it. Because something crazy was happening every day. And I was creating something crazy every day. You know, I rebelled against everything. You know, I remember my therapist, and I've shared this with people before. I used to go to my therapist, pay him money, by the way. I would go to him and I'd say, oh, I'm going to forget this. I mean, now, this is reasonable, right? If only the whole entire Catholic Church would change the rules on celibacy, then I would be okay. Isn't that a reasonable request? <laughs> I want the whole damn entire institution to change for me. That's reasonable, isn't it? And I had this strange therapist who kept saying to me, it's your issue, not the church's. I said, no, it's not. You know why? Because I was scared. I was scared of a part of me I didn't know nothing about. I was scared of a part of me that I didn't want to get in touch with. I was scared of a part of me I needed to make change. But that would take risk. That would take taking a step. That would take moving into something new. And I'm going to tell you a secret. Again, don't tell anybody, okay? It's scary. No matter what you do in life, I'll give you my favorite formula. No matter what you do in life, 25% of the people will like what you do, 
25% will hate what you do, and 50% won't give a damn one way or the other. And in two weeks, you'll be old news. But today, you'll be old news in two days with this crazy system as we have today. The bottom line is we're afraid to make decisions because we put so much pressure on ourselves and because we're scared of what we have to do when change comes along. But the biggest thing of all is we're afraid to let go of control. So what I've learned in recovery is that my spirit, my energy, is much stronger and much more powerful when I have a sense of faith, a sense of trust, and I learn what I call the spiritual words, those beautiful spiritual words on the face of the earth. The first one is called surrender. The second one is called acceptance. You know, it's so beautiful in life to be able to accept life, to learn from it, to grow from it, and move forward. My two favorite spiritual words, and I love them. And my two favorite spiritual words, supposed to. Now, why did you go through what you went through in your life? Because you were supposed to. Why did you experience what you experienced? Because you were supposed to. Why did you meet who you met in the course of your journey? Because you were supposed to. Why did you lose things in your life? Because you were supposed to. God, I can go nuts with this after a while. But the bottom line is, we make changes when we're supposed to and when we're ready. And all of us have to be ready at our own pace, at our own time. We have to be able to move this process forward. And so leaving a job that you're comfortable with and moving on to a new direction is scary because I'm used to the old. It was my security blanket. It reminds me of Linus in the old comic strip with his security blanket. He's afraid to let go of it. And when he does let go of it, he gets scared as hell. We're the same way. We even can make people our security blanket. Relationships. I mean, I always share that famous song from the 50s. I'm not going to sing. Don't get nervous. I'll probably scare you out of the room if I do. But the song went like this. You are my life. You are my everything. And you are my all. It means you're sick. <laughs> I mean, think for a minute. I'm telling you, you are my life, my everything, and my all. It sounds very romantic. Don't get me wrong. But guess what? It means you don't exist. <laughs> you know, it's crazy, the stuff that we do. And what I'm saying is that without you, I'm not here. Well, guess what? Yes, you are. And the bottom line is, that's false. And yet many of us get caught up in that where I want somebody else to tell me who I am. I want somebody else to define things for me. I want somebody else to literally make decisions for me. That's where those di addictions of anorexia and stuff like that come into play. I don't want to make any decisions. I get scared. You know, yesterday when I was at the rehab, I always do this to the addicts. I love doing it. I have a lot of fun, especially the young ones. I have a good time with them. But there's, I call them the three curse words of addicts. I always say to the addicts, I'm going to curse you. So get ready. They look at me. Oh, go ahead, they say. Go ahead and curse. Let us have it. I say, nah. See, I was a prison chaplain for nine years. I think I heard them all. Not a problem. I can, I can probably teach them a few. But that's beside the point. You know, but fear, it's unbelievable. So I said the three curse words. Reality, responsibility, and structure and discipline. A, excuse me for cursing. We all got to face reality every day. Last time I checked, I think the world we live in is dysfunctional. Isn't it wonderful? Fantastic. And every day I, I got to live in that reality. And I got to be able to take responsibility for my life and for my journey and not sit around and wait for somebody else to tell me what to do and how to do it. I got to be able to listen. I got to be able to learn. I got to learn from people that have gone before me. I got to open my heart, open my mind, and realize the fact that I'm never done. Please don't get done. Got to feel like you're in the oven. Don't get done, please. You know, I don't often say you want to really experience life. Go to a heart station at the hospital. Hook yourself up to the heart monitor. You better pray the sucker goes like this. 
hook yourself up and you got a straight line, you're done. Simple and plain. You're done for good. But the bottom line is, that's life. Life is a process of ups and downs. It's a process of a journey. And if you really are a truly spiritual person and you're in touch with yourself, you're going to be able to go into the dips and come back up again and realize that life takes you that way. Nothing's ever perfect. Perfect is death. Perfection is ridiculous. It's the journey of our humanness and our humanity. It's the learning we do from one another. It's our discovery. That's what this is really all about. It's like coming out of isolation and coming alive. It's like being reborn. It's like moving into a new dimension and a new place in the course of your journey. That's what it's really supposed to be all about. I don't care how old you are. It doesn't make a difference. I always tell my favorite story. When I was in a seminary, and I'm going back now to when I was like 21, 22 years old. I really was at one time. That was a long time ago. Wow. 1962. I don't want to go back there. Anyway, we had this professor at the seminary, Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg. His name was Father Pete Code. And Pete, when we had him for philosophy class, was 92 years old. Now, I'm 22 years old. What is this 92-year-old man going to teach me? He's old. He belongs, guess where? In a rocking chair on a front porch somewhere. What are you doing in a classroom? Well, the amazing part about it is that man had more experience I'll ever have in my whole entire life. That man had been through so many things. He was one of the best teachers I ever had. But here's the insanity of it. I never understood what he taught me until I was like 46 or 47 years old later on in my life. Do you ever notice how people keep trying to teach you things and help you take risks and help you to grow? but you don't hear them, but you do hear them, and maybe it doesn't really set in until later in your life. My father was a great teacher. He really was. Learned a lot from him. He used to tell me things that I think, you know, I used to joke a lot. He used to say, take it easy, little boy. Relax. Everything will be okay. Everything will be taken care of in God's time, not in your time. I think he, he want, must have gone to meetings back then. I don't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> You know, easy does it. Relax. Take it easy. Do where, you, where are you going? Relax. You'll learn. Don't worry. But see, I didn't, all that stuff he told me, I, I said, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Because I thought I had answers to everything. But I found later on, these were all the great teachers, the people that planted seeds, the people that gave you little messages. When will they come out? You never know. You never know when you're ready for them to come out. You can't, you can't predict any of this. It's a process that we go through. And it's simple little things that make life exactly what it is. It's the process of change. It's the process of taking risks. It's the process of moving on and realizing the fact that if I continue changing, continue growing, then I'm alive. I remember Father Pete, he died at age 99, by the way. He lived a full life. And I remember as seminarians, we had to be at his bedside. And here's a man who is getting ready to leave this world. And he says to me, right before he died, he said, come here. I said, what do you want? He said, give me a list. Go to the library and give me these books. In my mind, I'm saying, the man's dying. What the hell does he want books for? He said, go to the library and get me these books. I said, why? He said, because I want to learn something new before I die. I'm not done yet, he said to me. I said, OK, I went and got the books. And you know what? He picked those books up and started checking them out. And he said, isn't it neat to be able to continue to learn things about life, and discover things about life? And you know, I marveled at that. Because how could somebody on his deathbed be talking about learning and growing? You know, these are the experiences of life that you go through, that you experience from people. But you know, they're role models for us. They're showing us that, you know, life is supposed to be this adventure. But adventure involves change, it involves newness, it involves risk. 
It involves moving forward. It involves taking risks sometimes that you don't know where they're going to go. You know, I've learned so simple in this program not to worry about the future. I have no idea where it's going to go. All I know is I've got today. I have yesterday. Whatever happened yesterday, I got a choice. I can gripe about it, bitch about it, complain about it, or I can face yesterday, learn from it, and grow from it, and let it become my teacher. Nothing happens by accident. No matter what relationships you went through, no matter what happened, you might be angry, you might be frustrated, you might be going through stuff, and you wish it was a different way, but it's not a different way because it's not supposed to be a different way. See how simple it is? I hear this all the time. They say to me, do you, re do you ever regret the priesthood? I say, no. They were my teachable moments. They were part of my journey. I don't want to regret my history at all. My history is my teacher. And when in AA, they have a beautiful saying, and I love it. It says, keep your memory green. Remember where you came from. Please don't go back there, but remember where you came from. And always remember that you're in process of learning every day. And no one's any better than anybody else. We're just people on a journey. And everything we experience in life is part of who we are. And I've learned this in the process of life that if you're willing to take some risks and try new things now, will they always work? Sometimes. Sometimes they won't. And that's because they're not supposed to. See how simple it is? Not too complicated. I love making things simple. And also, I've learned something else. I shared this so many times in life. The old timers in AA taught me this a long time ago. They said, Vince, look, keep life simple. Do the best you can every day. Stay stupid. Don't try to figure it out. You're never going to figure life out. Just live it. Do it one day at a time and see where it takes you. And pray. Ask for help. Ask for guidance. Ask for direction. And realize the fact you can't do it by yourself. We're connected to other human beings. We learn from other. You can be the most intellectual person in the world. At the same time, you might be the dumbest person in the world. You may have a great intellect. You may have all the knowledge. But do you have spirit? Do you have internal energy? Do you really feel yourself on the inside and see the beauty of yourself? I'll never forget. I was at a court trial one time when I was a priest of a friend of mine who was on trial. And they basically had brought in an expert witness to talk about something, you know, in, in a kind of a legal precedent in an excellent way. Well, I was sitting in the back of the courthouse. This man was sitting next to me. Now, the man sitting next to me, I thought he was kind of a street person that came in off the street to watch the court case. He was disheveled. You know, his tie was crooked. He was sitting there. It looked like he was half asleep. They called the witness. He was the expert. <laughs> the man got up there and he was brilliant. He was brilliant. Somebody better teach him how to dress, but he was brilliant. <laughs> you know, but the bottom line was, see again, here it goes. You judge by externals. But the internals were totally different. And that's what happens in life a lot of times. People can judge you externally because we actually are on the outside, but what's really in the inside of a person? What's in their spirit? I remember when I first became a, 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 a county jail chaplain before I became a prison chaplain. I remember going to my first, I, I volunteered for the position because nobody else wanted it. So I'm a good codependent. If nobody else wants it, I take it, not a problem. But anyway, before I went in, they said to me, are you crazy? You're going into that place? You know what those, those people are probably going to hit you, and abuse you, do all kinds of stuff. Aren't you scared? Well, if I talked to them, I was scared. <laughs> I wasn't before that. But you know, even walking through that door for the first time was a risk. It was a change. I, I went in there, and I didn't know what I was going to experience. It was the unknown. And I used to be scared to death of the unknown. But I realized something today. 
The unknown only continues to be the unknown until you walk into it, then it becomes the known. See how simple it is? And it works. So the concept is, when I went in there, I met some pretty interesting people. They're human beings, just like me. But I learned a beautiful thing when I was in there. But for the grace of God, that could be me. But for the grace of God. I went up to Trenton State Prison and I visited the Varum building for the criminally insane. What an adventure. A great bunch of guys. It's fantastic. We used to play cards. We sit around and talk. You know, and to me, they seem normal. You know, good guys, though. What can I tell you? Did they, did they do some horrible things? Yeah, they did. But they're there. You know, I, I learned a lot in prison. I can open doors now without keys. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. <laughs> but I've learned a beautiful secret of change and growth, and that is laughter. To laugh at life. You know, life's going to take you in some very interesting journeys. Life's going to take you down some very interesting pits. Life's going to take you on very high adventures. But you've got to be able to laugh through life and enjoy life. You know, because let's face the facts of life. We've all gone through a lot in the course of our journey. And what's important is to realize the fact that it's a journey. You know, you're born, and one day you get the other part of the ticket, and you have to leave. Congratulations. I think I checked. We all got round-trip tickets. And God will punch you the second one someday. But on the journey, don't be afraid to be alive. Don't be afraid to live. Don't be afraid of change. You know, for a long period of time, my life change was the scariest word on the face of the universe for me. I was scared to death of it. But I was scared to move out of my cocoon because I was afraid. And fear, the only thing that conquers fear is love. So we have to learn to love ourselves, to build an experience of life with ourselves to build a sense of ourself as a person. And to realize the fact that I don't want to live in isolation. I don't want to run away and hide from the world. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. There are some days I wake up, I want to pull the blinds down, I want to lock the doors, and tell the whole world, go away. But you know what? I feel that. It's a feeling. Sometimes I might do it for a few hours, but it gets boring. Put the windows back up, put the shades up, go back out there and start the day. Because every time you walk out there and start a new day, it's a new adventure, a new chapter, new energy of your life. And change is the most beautiful thing on the face of the earth. Because when you experience change, you experience growth. It's part of the process. And nothing ever stays the same. So when are you done? You're done when you're done. But don't be done. Keep it simple and stay open to the process of life. And I really believe that our connection to a higher power, our connection to our growth, even in recovery. I mean, a lot of people come into recovery for short periods of time, and they don't get it right away. They have to get a headache a little bit more, some more agita, get a little more crazy. Then they come back and try it again. Then they do it again. That's why we keep it simple. You know, there's, there's no one way. There's many ways many concepts, many directions, many things. We get caught up in it sometimes because we're looking for the answer. And there is no answer. There's just wonderment. There's the unknown. There's the beginnings. And I always remember and I always believe this, that the day I die, I hope anyway I will. I have to learn to be grateful for today. Whatever happens today was, was, was supposed to happen. Here's that supposed to again. You know, I don't know about tomorrow. Do I have a scheduling book? I'm a codependent. I got a scheduling book that's all set till July sometime. I don't know. You know, got it all hooked up, not a problem. You know, but you know, I love it so much because nothing ever stays the same. I put a schedule out. You got a copy of it right there. And it goes till July, July 31st. I bet you it changes about six times between now and then. <laughs> and right. Well, you said you were, don't worry about it. You know, if something better came up, we try something else. We'll see what happens. You know? 
But we get so rigid sometimes. That's that isolation thing again. I get rigid. It's got to be a certain way. I got to do it a certain way. Why? Isn't it much more fun to be more adventurous, to have a bucket list, to do things you never experienced before, to try new things? If you live in fear, you live in death. If you open the doors up, you find new things and new directions in life. And yet, I'm going to tell you right now, we have an Italian disease. It's called un capitosa. It means we're brickheads. We've got to do it the hard way first, get some scars, beat the crap out of ourselves, and then finally get sick and tired of being sick and tired, then finally we wake up. Isn't it amazing? I love the human condition. I got to go bang my head against the wall until I found out, find out it's a wall. And the sucker ain't going to move. I got to realize that fact. I have to realize the fact, what am I banging my head against the wall for? But see, it's hard. It's got to get softened up a little bit. My father had a great analogy, and I connected it to recovery. He worked on a section gang on a railroad. He used to say, you take a ball-peen hammer, and you take a rock, and you pound at it, you pound at it, and you pound at it, until eventually the rock splits and then you crush it. Isn't that us? The ball-peen hammer is the higher power. You know, my favorite movie, The Lion King. You got my buddy Rafiki, the monkey. He runs around here chasing Simba with a stick. Bang, he hits him on the head. He says, get your ass back where it belongs, in the circle. Stop, get off the damn self-pity pot. And he, he says, ow! And he keeps smacking him until he's back in there again. You know, and sometimes, you know, life is exactly like that. We get smacked around a little bit. We get to learn the hard way sometimes. But the hard way is the good way. It's the secret way. That's what life really is all about. So try to open your mind. Try to break out of isolation. Realize the fact that change is actually special and beautiful. To look at life through the eyes of change to the eyes of releasing. And don't be in control. You ain't got to control. Control's a disease. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to always be your way. Things will go where they're supposed to go. I don't have any guarantees. You know, I, I work in a rehab a lot of times. I can't guarantee those people I'm talking to sobriety. I can't even guarantee myself sobriety. I got to work it one day at a time. I can't guarantee anything. I can plant some seeds. I can hope that eventually the seeds will get nurtured. That's what my, my favorite 12-step meeting, my favorite AA meeting on the face of this earth is the mustard seed in Philadelphia. I love that meeting, 17th and Samson, the mustard seed. That little, little seed produces this beautiful tree, this beautiful growth. Isn't that amazing? I remember 1976. A good friend of mine, Norm, taking me to that meeting. And I realized the name of that meeting is so special and so beautiful. And I learned that from the mustard seed comes growth. Same thing as regards us. The little things, the changes, the development, whatever happened to you today was supposed to happen. That's why I love that word supposed to. Isn't it great? Why are you here tonight? Because you're supposed to be here tonight. Why am I here tonight? Because I'm supposed to be here. It's amazing, isn't it? Come right down to it. Where will I be tomorrow? I don't know. I, I got tomorrow scheduled, but I'll get on my knees tomorrow morning. I'm going to say the 11 step prayer again, and I'm going to say, God, whatever you got in store for me, bring it on. And you know, whatever comes, comes. You know, and I'll guarantee you it'll get screwed up before the day's over. And that's okay. You know, whatever it is, it is. I am getting older, I look at things differently today. But I'm no different than you or anybody else. I always do it the hard way first. That's because, you know, that's how we learn, I guess. We've got to beat ourselves up and then take care of ourselves. We have to realize the fact that we're on a journey. And so what I want to do, basically, is next week spend time talking about what I call the fantasy addictions. 
the fantasy addictions are centralized around a major issue of shame, guilt, things that we, secrets, things we've developed over the course of life, how to break the cycle of shame. There's a beautiful book out. John Bradshaw wrote it a long time ago. It's called Healing the Shame That Binds Me. It's a powerful book. And to me, that is one of the key things we have to learn in life, to heal the shame. Because shame can drag you down, tear you apart, and tear you to shreds. We have to learn the fact that we're not. Don't live in shame. Are shameful things happen? Yes. Can I learn from them? Yes. Can I heal them? Yes. We'll work on that next week. And then the week after that, we'll work on all the wonderful caretaking addictions. By the way, that particular lecture on caretaking, we're going to go from 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's the story of me. Whew. It's amazing, isn't it? Come right down to it. Now, don't get nervous. We're not going to go to 1 o'clock. i got to be careful with codependence. Because if I say that, they'll expect it to go to 1 o'clock. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but I mean, that's the fun part about it, too. So live, laugh, love, have a good time, celebrate who you are, and celebrate life. Two announcements real quick. At 8 o'clock tonight in room 29, we have a Naranon meeting. You're more than welcome to attend. It's every week and it meets right here in room 29 at the end of this hall. We also, at 8 o'clock tonight, have meditation class. Tony is supposed to be here. He told me today that he was going to be here. I think he's in Course in Miracles now. But Tony will run the meditation class, possibly in my office if the other group isn't missing. You can check it out your own. See that guy over there? The Italian right there, see him? <laughs> So he'll show you where it is if you want to know where the meditation class is. Okay? So thanks for coming out. We have a way to be closed. Can we join hands and we'll say the serenity prayer? Come on, Kavon. Get over here, will you? Okay, who woke us up this morning? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We are somebody special, because God don't make no junk. Good job. The sign-up sheet's up here, anybody for those groups, if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Well, they're all good, but... That's good. I'm glad. Thank you. Can you push that little button and shut that off for me, okay? Or in the back. Oh, i gotta, got to remember I'm wired. <laughs> See you next week, all right? Take care of yourself. You hear me? You're welcome. Yeah. You hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Do me a favor. Will you take this thing off me?